Ever since I was born, there has really only been one question on my mind, and that is how does the monetary financial system work? To find out, I took all economics classes I could in high school, did a bachelor in economics and a master in finance. But it was only during my PhD studies that I came across a framework that finally helped me to make sense of the monetary system of any country. That framework is called the hierarchy of money. And in this video, I'll share a simple visualization of it with you. The main point of the hierarchy of money is that some forms of money are better than others, hence it being named a hierarchy. When the economy is doing well, this hierarchy can be difficult to see. However, when there is a crisis, it will become immediately obvious that your hedge fund investments are better sold in exchange for money in the bank. And when the going really gets tough, you might even be better off to run to your local bank and withdraw all of your money to walk home with a bag of cold hard cash. I like to visualize the hierarchy of money as a circle where there is a monetary core of central bank money, a large monetary periphery of private bank money and an even larger financial crust that contains all other financial instruments. And that, my dear viewer, is the monetary system in a nutshell. Now let's dive into each layer and discuss its characteristics as well as the relationship to the other layers. The first layer is the monetary core and in all modern economies this money is issued by the central bank. Some of this can be used by the public, for example banknotes, coins and perhaps in the future a central bank digital currency. But there is also a substantial part of this money, namely central bank reserves, which can typically only be used by banks. Now importantly, the size of the monetary core is not fixed. It fluctuates. In fact, it fluctuates on a daily basis. The core increases in size whenever banks borrow reserves or cash from the central bank and it shrinks if banks reduce their central bank borrowing. This is why I chose to visualize the hierarchy of money as a circle, because now I can show you this crucial point, and that is that the monetary system is not static the money supply fluctuates daily. Now, this framework has been so helpful to me because it helped me structure some of the most important discussions in monetary economics. For example, when I discussed actual physical money printing in my previous video, I was talking about expanding the size of notes and coins. So this was a discussion about the monetary core. But perhaps you are interested in quantitative easing. Using the hierarchy of money framework, we can easily see that it is similar, but not quite the same as money printing, because quantitative easing is about increasing the size of reserves rather than the number of notes and coins. Or are you one of those economists who likes to think that gold is the only true form of money? Well, in that case, you are arguing that an inflexible gold money supply should be at the center of the monetary core. In each of these cases, the hierarchy of money framework has helped us frame the discussion. That way, while we might still differ in opinion, at least we're talking about the same things. Next, let's move out one layer to the monetary periphery. The monetary periphery is built on top of the monetary core. This layer still consists of money, however the monetary instruments in this layer are issued by private banks rather than by the central bank. In most modern economies, this layer consists of digital bank accounts. However, throughout history, some private banks have issued their own physical banknotes and these would also sit here in the monetary periphery. Notice that all instruments in the monetary periphery are promises to pay central bank money that is from the monetary core. After all, you can walk to an ATM right now to change your bank account money for cash. But if we all do this, the banking system is in trouble, precisely because the monetary periphery is much bigger than the monetary core. And that is not all. It is not only much larger than the monetary core, it is also much more flexible. 
As banks create money through lending, the monetary periphery expands and if people pay down their bank loans, the monetary periphery shrinks. If you want to know more about how exactly private banks create money, check out my video on this subject, which I have linked in the top right corner of the screen. And if you have already seen it or are already familiar with this discussion, you might now see how using the hierarchy of money, this discussion can firmly be placed in the region of the monetary periphery. But of course, the monetary periphery is built on the monetary core. So when you watch my video on how central banks try to control the money supply via interest rates, you can think of this discussion being about managing the relationship between the monetary core and the monetary periphery. If the central bank increases interest rates, this relationship becomes stronger and banks will be less inclined to increase the monetary periphery without an increase in the monetary core. Another example is a very strict gold standard regime where there is no central bank at all. This is something that a lot of YouTube videos are advocating for, especially in the United States. They long back for a time in which there was no central bank. In that time, the monetary core consisted purely of gold and silver, a core that is relatively inflexible. However, this does not mean that the money supply is completely inflexible, since the monetary periphery is still very active. It still created a lot of money in the days before central banks, and subsequently there were a lot of bank crises when the periphery became too big relative to the core and the system collapsed. Okay, now let's move on to the final layer in the monetary system, the financial crust. The financial crust consists of all financial instruments that are not bank money. While these might be accepted as payments in some places of the economy, they are not generally accepted. That is why I don't consider these instruments to be part of the monetary core or periphery. However, because instruments in the financial crust are still used as payment in many parts of the economy, and because this layer is typically bigger than the monetary periphery, it is still essential for any monetary economist. Take for example the liabilities of a money market fund. When I'm investing in my online trading platform, I first transfer my bank money to a money market fund account. On the surface, my money market fund account looks a lot like my bank account. However, I can only use it to buy stocks. This means that as long as I am investing, it's pretty much indistinguishable from money. Also, since the money market fund can invest my bank money elsewhere, from an economic perspective, something that looks a lot like money has just been created. However, since I couldn't use it to buy groceries, money market fund accounts are in the financial crust rather than in the monetary periphery. Another example of instruments in the financial crust are those coins that you use to buy drinks at a festival. When you buy these coins at the start of a festival, it could be argued that new money was just created. After all, your bank money has just been transferred to the organizers of the festival. At the same time, you now have some plastic coins that from your perspective can be used as money to buy drinks and food. As the music keeps playing, these plastic coins are just as, if not more, valuable than money in your bank account. However, because this money is not universally accepted, I only consider it part of the financial crust. So whenever I meet a monetary economist that tells me everyone can create money, the problem is just to get it accepted. I now know that they are talking about the fact that anyone can expand the financial crust, but that the problem is to move your money up the hierarchy, potentially even into the monetary periphery or core. This is for example what Facebook was trying to do when they announced their Libra coin, or what was envisioned by the creators of Bitcoin. So that was the hierarchy of money visualized, the framework that I used to make discussions about monetary matters less confusing. I hope it will do the same for you. If you have not done so already, I invite you to check out some of my previous videos on money printing, private bank money and monetary policy and try to place them using the hierarchy of money. 
From now on I will use this visualization in future videos about the role of gold in the monetary system, the difference between quantitative easing and money printing and many more. If there is a specific monetary or financial subject that you would like me to explore and place in the hierarchy of money, let me know down in the comments. And while you're at it, don't forget to subscribe to the channel so you'll be notified when I publish the next videos.